Hello everybody, Julian Charles here of TheMindRenewed.com, coming to you from the depths of the Lancashire countryside here in the UK. And today I'm very pleased to welcome to the programme Dr. Kyle Greenwood, who is Associate Professor of Old Testament and Hebrew Language at Colorado Christian University. Dr. Greenwood has served as an editor for the academic book since the beginning, interpreting Genesis 1 to 2 through the ages, and contributed to the ancient Near East historical texts in translation and dictionary of the Old Testament historical books. He sits on the editorial board for the Journal of the Evangelical Study of the Old Testament and has served on the editorial board of the Bulletin for Biblical Research and has written for several publications including Catholic Biblical Quarterly and Journal of Ancient Near Eastern Religions. Dr. Greenwood, thank you very much indeed for joining us on The Mind Renewed. Uh, Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for taking time out of your day to speak with us. Now, we're going to be discussing your book, uh, Scripture and Cosmology, which was published in 2015, which is actually a book that I requested from the publisher because issues of biblical interpretation have come up on this program a number of times, especially how we might best understand the very first chapters of Genesis. And so I was very keen to read this, read what you had to say and have this opportunity to speak to you. Now, your book has the uh, intriguing subtitle which you told me before the interview was actually supplied by InterVarsity Press, um, (laughs) called uh, Reading the Bible Between the Ancient World and Modern Science. And I was actually quite intrigued by that word between. It struck me because uh, I thought that something like this could have been said about the book, reading the Bible in the light of modern science, or perhaps reclaiming the Bible's ancient worldview from modern science, something like that. But that's not what it says. The word that's used is between, reading the Bible between the ancient world and modern science. So I guess what I'm asking you for the first question is if you could introduce what it is essentially you do in this book and why it says reading the Bible between the ancient world and modern science. The title, yes, yeah, as, as you mentioned, is from inter, or the subtitle from InterVarsity Press is what they suggested, and I certainly agreed with that title. And I, I guess what they were after in that subtitle and in trying to tease out what I'm trying to get at in the book is that we do sometimes find the a tension between the ancient world that's found in Hebrew scriptures and Christian scriptures as well as well as what we find in in modern science. And so where does our interpretation lie within those two tensions maybe? Hmm. And also maybe how do we bridge that gap so that there is not this false dichotomy between what scripture says and what uh, modern science says and so that we're not having this unnecessary tension Hmm. between these two fields. And that's a very difficult thing to do unless you have some understanding really of both the ancient world and the modern world. And of course, we're familiar, we think anyway, that we're familiar with the modern world, but a lot of the ancient world is rather veiled to us. And this is one of the things that your book does so really very well. It does unveil that for us in many ways. Um, You use the word cosmology, and this is your title this time. What do you mean by that as you use it in the book? Cosmology is very generally speaking the study of the cosmos and our understanding of the natural world we might think of of the universe but in the ancient world there was no such thing as a concept of of a universe with galaxies and supernova and for the ancients what is out there was pretty much whatever you could see with your eyes and was not particularly far away either. You know, we're not going to measure it in terms of miles or kilometers or anything like that, but just in terms of it's just up there, right? It's just it's just one one plane away, basically. Hmm. So the cosmos is kind of just a, a generic term to try to incorporate both how the ancients would have viewed the heavens and how moderns would view the universe or multiverse, if, according to some. Hmm. Now. You are studying ancient Near East texts and customs, etc., etc., and you say in the book that what you're doing is a contextual method when you look at the world around the Hebrew people back in the day. You are setting that in the context of the ancient Near East, and you say that this helps to avoid two extremes which you describe as parallelomania and parallelophobia. Can you tell us what you're getting at there? Well, this this comes out of the the early discussions when 
ancient Near East was so-called rediscovered. You know, the the texts written by the Mesopotamians were largely ignored or unheard of for millennia. Even in Egypt, a lot of these texts were not quite given the attention that one would think in terms of the Bible. But in the um, late 1700s, early 1800s, when the Rosetta Stone was discovered, in the middle of the 1800s, when the texts from Mesopotamia were unearthed, and not just unearthed, but deciphered. And then along with that comes texts from Anatolia, from Ugarit, that is ancient Canaan. All these texts suddenly started emerging, and not unexpectedly, some people got a little <laughs> overexcited about all these texts and what they might mean for for the Bible. And, and so this became parallelomania, where where scholars were looking in every nook and cranny to find a connection to the biblical text. And in often cases, they would find that the source of a biblical text came from Mesopotamia. And so there was this sense during that time of over-exuberance of the connection between these two. Uh -huh. Did, along with that, go the attitude that in some way that explained the biblical text away, which is not the impression I get from your book? Correct. There were certainly some scholars who did that. To, the most notable one, of course, is the, the flood narrative, Genesis 6 through 9, and Ashahasis, the, the Mesopotamian flood story, and also Enuma Elish, a creation story, and the parallels that were found with Genesis 1. And so some scholars were looking at these pairs of texts from Mesopotamia and the Bible and say, well, the Bible cannot be an inspired scripture. It derived from Mesopotamia. It's just a copycat version <laughs> of Mesopotamian uh, mythology. Which, strictly speaking, is a genetic fallacy, isn't it? Just because you can, you can show where something might have received influence from does not necessarily mean that it's not true, neither that it's not inspired. That's, yeah, that's correct. So that was the pendulum swinging way in, in one direction. And then the pendulum swung completely in the opposite direction. And so people were, that's a parallel of phobia. They were afraid to make any connections between, <laughs> between uh, the biblical text <laughs> yeah, and yeah. these ancient Mesopotamian and other regions uh, texts. So the contextual method kind of developed as a way of seeing, yes, there is value in looking at the text from Egypt, Mesopotamia, Canaan, Anatolia, but just being careful to not draw a direct genetic line, as you said, from one to the other, mm. but basically helping us to see these are representative of the ways in which people thought. Right. Their view of the world, their view of the cosmos, their view of life, their view of death, uh, how they carried out ritual practices, all these different things are helpful in giving some context, some background to the biblical text since they lived in the same region, they lived at around the same time, and those sorts of things. Hmm. Okay. Um, now, some people will react in this way. They might say, well, you know, if you're saying the Bible shares cosmology of the ancient Near East, then wouldn't that mean that the Bible has been substantially influenced by the pagan world? So wouldn't that be a justified concern? Oh, it's certainly a concern that has been raised, but no more so than uh, the fact that um, the New Testament was written in Greek and the uh, Greek tragedies were written in Greek, for lack of a better term. It is, language is part of culture. Hmm. There are a lot of things that are part of culture that have nothing to do with, uh, with one's religious convictions. Right. So if we look back at the uh, Hebrew scriptures, for example, in the Old Testament, they engaged in a lot of practices that pagans also engaged in. For example, they offered a sacrifice to their deity. Pagans offered sacrifices to their deity. The Hebrews offered sacrifices on high elevations, high places. Pagans offered sacrifices on high elevations or high places. This does not mean that the Hebrews are borrowing pagan ideas, sure. but rather and this kind of gets to a point that I make much later in the book, the idea of accommodation, but God speaking into a culture and language that they understand. So if God is going to ask a particular people, I would appreciate your sacrifices. I would appreciate you to giving me your due instead of giving 
uh, Baal and the other deities there do. Yeah. One way of doing that is to use conventions that they are already aware of. Now, that makes a lot of sense. And I was just thinking of a New Testament parallel to that, perhaps, in the writing of John's Gospel and John using some elements of Greek Stoic philosophy, some suggestions of that to speak about Jesus as the Logos. Um, sure. Again, you, you can't criticize that, can you? That's, as you say, an accommodation to the thought forms at the time. And we're going to come back to that very important aspect of accommodation later on in the interview. Um, so, Can I interrupt real quick? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Because you just brought to my mind the idea of Paul and speaking, uh, I believe it's at Mars Hill, right? Mm. Uh, in terms of the statue of the unknown god. Oh, yes. Yes. Right? It's an example of him speaking into a culture, using a cultural language that they would understand to bring a very different and provocative message to them. Mm. You know, culture is something we just can't escape. So to say that the ancient Hebrews are borrowing from the culture of the Mesopotamians or borrowing from the Egyptians is, is just a mistake of understanding what culture really means. Hmm. Um, I'm just wondering what reaction you've had since the book was published a couple of years ago now. Could you share anything of that with us? I think by and large, what I've, what I've seen has been a positive response. Uh, some of my current and former students have commented on it being helpful for them to making, having understanding of the ancient world. And I think that's probably the biggest obstacle for a lot of us in the modern world is to understanding the Old Testament is, as you mentioned kind of early on, the, the Old Testament is, is so veiled to us. Hmm. When it comes to the New Testament, oftentimes we, we are quick to try to look for the cultural connections. For example, the faith like a mustard seed, and we're, we're excited to know what a mustard seed meant and why Jesus would use that particular example or the various uses of the Greek word for love and why agape is used here. But when it comes to the Old Testament, for some reason, we we tend to shut down there, mm. stop doing our homework. <laughs> I suppose it's yet another big step back into the past, isn't it? Yeah. Well, even if, you know, even if we don't go into pre-Mosaic times, but even the time of David or the time of Solomon, these are still a very different world with a different language, a different commerce, a different way of thinking about the realities of life. That is part of the problem, but geographical distance, but more importantly, it's chronological distance. So yeah. that's where I've had some positive feedback from the book in terms of trying to understand the Old Testament world uh, more explicitly. I think some of the pushback I've had comes primarily from the third part of the book, hmm. the third section where I deal with kind of the modern yeah. implications. And uh, some of my more conservative friends and, and brothers and sisters in Christ are a little bit more leery of making the connection with uh, what this means in terms of evolution and modern science and biological uh, sciences and those sorts of things. Okay, yes. And indeed, in a few minutes from now, you may find the same reaction to some extent from me, which I warned you about <laughs> at the beginning. But we'll, we'll get to that in a few minutes from now. So I just want to say before we get into more of the meat of the book itself that uh, I did very much enjoy the book. Um, I do think it's illuminating in a number of ways. I think it's very well written, easy to understand for the non-specialist, such as myself. It's very clearly filled with real substance, however. There's no padding in this book. It's very challenging in a gentle way, I would say, and it invites us to think more clearly about how we go about interpreting the scripture, if indeed we do bother to interpret the scripture. So I do recommend this. Um, Thank you. So just before we jump into the meat, could you tell us um, just a little bit more about yourself, Dr. Greenwood? Um, you currently lecture in Old Testament and Hebrew at Colorado Christian University. What attracted you to the study of the Old Testament? Uh, we need another couple of days for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> Fair it's enough. <laughs> a, a long story. Uh, I'll try to cut to the chase. Hmm. Shortly after college, I went into full-time ministry, but realized in ministry that I was ill-equipped to be a full-time minister of the gospel. I was, while I had pretty strong lay training in scriptures, my formal training was lacking. And so when I had an opportunity a few years later to enter seminary, I did so. And the primary goal of entering seminary was to continue on into full-time Christian ministry. 
Hmm. Uh, I caught the Hebrew bug my second year of seminary, and having already taken Greek, I realized this uh, biblical language thing is kind of fun. <laughs> um, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which uh, surprises a lot of people, a number of my students as well, who are who sometimes struggle through intro to Hebrew. <laughs> but but I had a, a mentor in seminary, Bill Arnold, Dr. Bill Arnold, who kind of demonstrated to me how to go about uh, studying the Old Testament, and he demonstrated a love for the study of the Old Testament that was somewhat infectious. Uh -huh. And the more I learned about it, the more I wanted to learn more about it. And the, before I knew it, I was applying to graduate schools uh -huh. in Old Testament, much to my uh, surprise. I think what surprised me most is when I ran the idea by my wife she gave me the approval. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and that's the most important thing to have, of course. Yes. I thought that would be the end of the discussion once I broached that with my wife, but uh, she was fully supportive of that. And, uh, and I continued the educational process. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you testify there to the importance of the teacher sowing those, I don't remember who said it, sowing the golden seeds of encouragement in the student. I think it's extremely important for everybody who's involved in teaching there to be encouraging and be that infectious influence. Um, okay, so your book is organized into three main parts. You've got eight chapters, but in three parts. I'm just going to very briefly summarize those three so that we know what we're aiming at here. Part one looks at the ancient Near East cosmology, um, shows how the Bible basically shares that. Part two, um, which we'll have less time for because it's quite intricate, you discuss how various interpreters of the Bible have felt the need to accommodate their reading of the Bible to fit with how the changing understanding of the universe uh, is progressing through the ages. Very, very interesting. It does bring up some controversies, of course. Um, the third part, then, is you said before, you draw some conclusions for our own reading of Scripture in our contemporary context. So looking at that first part, um, Scripture and cosmos in cultural context, you call it. So you make this point, the Bible shares what you call the three-tier cosmos idea that was common in the ancient world. So what is that three-tier picture? The three tiers, as I describe it, are the, the heavens, the earth, and the seas. There's others who divide those three into the heavens, the earth, and the underworld. And I understand why they're doing that, because in some cases you do see in Scripture that kind of terminology. But the vast majority of times in the Old Testament, we have heavens, earth, and seas used in a triad of sorts. Uh, the birds of the heavens, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the earth. In fact, we find that in numerous places throughout the Old Testament. In fact, I just opening somewhat randomly to here at Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6, this beginning of Ezra's prayer, you are the Lord, you alone, you made the heaven, the heaven of heavens with all their hosts, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And so that the heavens, the earth and the seas, and in this particular prayer, he mentions not only those things, but the things that inhabit those areas. Mm. So this so, is so, why I... So, so it's yeah, so this, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say that you, it's ahead. significant that this triad appears time and again. Correct. It's not just occasionally. This this is something that happens a lot. That is correct. Hmm. Uh, we see this in the Ten Commandments. We see this in Genesis 1. We see this in Proverbs 8 and Psalm 19. Um, Job 38. And sometimes it's not mentioned explicitly, but it's described explicitly. So everything that is being described within a psalm, for example, is describing all the things in the heavens, the sun, the moon, the stars. Then it's to all the things that are on the earth, the beasts of the earth, the you know, flowers of the field, yeah. to the seas. The, and so, so oftentimes we see this throughout the Old Testament of these three elements being in this triad of the cosmos. Okay, so just listening to what you say there, obviously listeners don't have the benefit at the moment of reading your book. People might be thinking, well, okay, so you have their evidence of a threeness of sort. Mm -hmm. Could it not just be that you have three things being described and there's a tradition of describing these three things? How do we know they comprise the cosmos in the ancient world's thinking? Well, the, the primary reason is because whenever the Old Testament describes the cosmos, it describes them in these, these three ways, mm -hmm. with exception to the fact that sometimes um, the underworld is mentioned. But when that is done, it is done so because there are no sea creatures of which to speak in that particular context. So there's no need then to mention that particular tier of the cosmos. If we're talking about the divine human relationship, for example, 
there's no humans in the sea for, right. with whom to God, for God to have that relationship. Hmm. And this threeness is bound by other features, is it not? Such as the firmament, which you give the impression in the book was universally believed that there was a firmament, that this was solid? Correct, at, le at least in the texts that discuss it. Right. Um, where the firmament is discussed, it has elements of firmness to it, hence the firmament from the Latin. The idea is that it, it is a barrier with a couple of different functions. The floor of God's throne room, if God is in the heavens, the earth is his footstool, God's holy temple in the heavens has a floor that is suspended above the earth, and that firmament is the floor of that. It's also the ceiling for that which is below the ceiling from which the stars hang, hmm. uh, the sun and the moon traverse during their courses, and also the other planets, which were also the other planets like Venus and Mercury were also thought of as stars at that time because they were not able to uh, make that distinction. So it has to be solid then in their imagination in order to keep the waters back and so that the throne doesn't fall through and all those sorts of things, presumably? That, that's correct, yeah. Okay. Um, you suggest that the Bible also pictures it as a tent with poles sometimes. Right. Well, it's still the same idea of a roof, hmm. but it kind of depends on the analogy and where the people are dwelling. If they're tent dwellers, the tent is the, the analogy that is most apparent to them. Yeah. Whereas if they're more urban dwellers, then, of course, the temple, the rooftop, the something like that is going to be more of the hmm. likely analogy there. But the point is, is still the same. It's a rooftop. Mm. And the poles would be mountains, do you say? Is that right? The poles function like the mountains function. So in the ancient world, they, they thought of the firmament at least cosmologically thinking as being some sort of support system for this rooftop. How else is this roof going to stay up? <laughs> well, the high peaks that are off in the distance, they must be the answer to that question. Mm. That's a very reasonable hypothesis. <laughs> if you don't actually climb the mountains to find out. <laughs> um, although I suppose you could go and find out and then disprove your hypothesis, and perhaps many of them did. Now, one thing that uh, intrigues me about this are the pillars, because uh, certain cultures, you say, picture the world as sitting upon these pillars, but others thought of it as floating right. on a cosmic ocean. Correct. Um, what, what, what's the Bible's view of that? Yeah, well, the, the earth rests on something hmm. that they know. If they think of the earth as being flat or flat-ish, <laughs> okay. not a completely level plane, but some sort of flat-ish disk where the only known world that they would be aware of are those who are around them. You know, When you consider that people in the ancient world, on average, traveled – no more than 30 miles from their home. Most people wow. were not aware of the rest of the earth. And so what they know is what they can see for the most part. Now you have travelers and caravans and that sort of thing that travel a little bit further. Mm. But even then, it's limited to what we would call today for the most part, you know, the Middle East. And if this particular piece of land is either cut off by mountains or cut off by sea, then the land that they know is pretty isolated. Well, how is this land, what's holding this up? Everything that they know has something to hold it up. The firmament has mountains to hold it up. So what holds up the earth? So the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians in some traditions thought of the earth as floating on water. And this makes some sort of sense, given the fact that there's a lot of marshland around. Yeah. Uh, they dig down to drill a well, and there's water coming up out of the ground. <laughs> so yeah, it so does, it's yes. somewhat logical to conclude that there's water all around them, and so the earth itself must be floating on that. So that's one, uh, one idea. Mm -hmm. The other idea is kind of built on the building analogy in that every building has a foundation. And so the earth also must have a foundation, and this is the model that we typically find in the Old Testament. Pillars that are the foundation of the earth structure. Mm. Whereas now, of course, we know it's built upon turtles, but that's another. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> um, yeah, indeed. Um, but one that uh, you do mention in the book, a bit of a counterexample, but was left sort of floating in midair, which is an interesting expression to use about it, uh, is from Job 26, verse 7. He stretches out the north over the void and hangs the earth on nothing. Right. What do you make of that? It's a very intriguing statement. Yeah, I've actually been doing some work on that particular section of verses of the last couple of years, hmm. and I'm convinced now that 
uh, Job 26, 7 through 12 is dealing with the underworld. And the nothing there is actually a reference to Sheol, uh-huh. the place beneath the ground where the dead reside. And there's a number of key elements within there, uh, within those verses. For example, the mention of the Rephaim, uh, which are underworld entities. Also, the fact that Avadon, uh, destruction, is um, often associated with Sheol. And probably more, more importantly, as we have the antithesis of the heavens there as well, from the heavens down to this place on which the, the earth hangs. So, so I'm pretty convinced here that Job 26 is the earth hanging on nothing is really not a suspension in outer space, but rather a reference to the netherworld. Yeah, that, that brings up another point. It's very interesting what you just said there, because it reminds me of attempts that are made and understandably, attempts that are made to try to harmonize what is said in the scripture with the findings of modern science. Right. Um, but you say that those attempts are very often not really right thinking about this. Yeah, too often we, we try to accommodate scripture to modern science rather than just let scripture speak on its own terms. Hmm. You know, this one verse hanging on nothing Boy, that sounds pretty convincing on its own. But when you look around it in in the context of Job 26, if we stick to that interpretation, we find ourselves to be pretty inconsistent exegetes of Scripture and pretty poor interpreters of what is going on in in that passage and, and the verses around it. Would you say that the same sort of thing happens when people try to say that Genesis 1-1 is speaking somehow about the Big Bang? Yeah, we have to be careful about all those things, right? As mm. We have to remember, first and foremost, who the original audience was. Now, we don't know precisely who that was, but it wasn't us. And it wasn't people who were familiar with a Big Bang. They weren't familiar with how the cosmos is structured, how the universe works, and Einstein's theory of relativity, you know, uh, Newton's laws, you know, all these things. So uh, what we have to do then is teach those original hearers about modern science for them to understand what scripture said. And that just seems a little bit backwards to me. Right. And I suppose had God communicated to those people in terms of modern science, it would have, would have got nowhere. Correct. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, just in the middle of this, how literal should we understand a lot of this language? I mean, for them, um, for those people in the ancient world, I mean, just in the case of, I mean, you mentioned this, I think this is Isaiah 66 verse one, thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Mm-hmm. I mean, how literal should we consider that they understood that to be because this is anthropomorphic language it seems to me to be metaphorical sure um you know you're you're talking about god being up in heaven and needing uh, a floor um and having a throne and here we have a footstool but right you know there's there are no feet to be seen um so what's going on there yeah i think that's an excellent question an excellent point and what i would say is we approach scripture as we approach other literature. And it's not to say that scripture is just any other piece of literature. No. But it is still literature. Mm-hmm. And it's still written with uh, literary forms, with literary styles, mm. and uh, by authors who are familiar with literary forms and styles. And so we have to pay attention to those types of communicative efforts. For example, when Jesus is speaking in parable, oftentimes he doesn't say, Now let me tell you a parable. Mm. We pick up on those parables because of other clues and cues that he gives us. One of the more famous examples is the one of the Good Samaritan. He just goes right in and tells this story to illustrate the point of who was a neighbor. And nowhere in there does he say, now this is a parable. (laughs) But along the way, we know that he is telling a parable. In fact, he kind of ends the ends the story by saying, so what did you learn from this? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, it's interesting, actually, because they knew that this was a parable, but I've actually come across people in, in the modern context who then ask, well, what will happen to those people afterwards? <laughs> you know, I've not picked up on, on how a parable works. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the same thing goes for the Old Testament as well. And so we recognize things like metaphor. We recognize things like analogy. And so the point I guess I would make and maybe anticipate the pushback on 
points that I'm making in terms of the three tiers is that Mm. these are not just analogies here and there, but they are rather frequent. They're rather consistent and they're not just consistent in scripture, but they're also consistent with what we find in the rest of the ancient world. So even if I were to relent and say, you're correct, it's analogy, this, and this is just metaphor and they don't really believe this. It is still a metaphor that they all used. So it's a word picture that at the very least is a way of communicating pretty clearly a concept about how the cosmos is structured. Yeah, I think I get what you mean. So when we take this passage, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, I'm getting the impression this would be some kind of poetic extension of the picture that you've presented. So that if you were actually to ask them, well, do you think God actually does regard this as his footstool, where where is his foot? They would say, well, don't be so ridiculous. But nevertheless, they still had in their imagination this sense of God being up there in some sense. So this is a poetic extension. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, uh, the waters really do intrigue me. These cosmic waters that you say uh, were imagined to surround the whole cosmos. Is this the same as the deep that is described in Genesis 1 verse 2? Yeah, there are several facets of these cosmic waters and the, the Apsu and, Mes- and uh, Akkadian, uh, the deep is one of those. Um, Generally speaking, the deep is considered the um, sweet, deep waters of the terrestrial ocean. Also, it's the source of the wells, the springs. It's the source of of virtually all of the fresh water that is potable. Not to be confused with the, the sea, the yam, which is salt water and is often associated with rough water with chaotic water it's the it's when jesus walks on the sea and calms the sea it demonstrates his authority over that particular tier of of the cosmos so that's much more significant for the hearers at the time than we realize yeah because there's always this tension in the bible about what this sea is you mentioned job earlier we go later on in the book of job and uh, when God goes on his monologue there at the end of the book, and his little lecture to Job, and he asks him, you know, were you there? Did you set the boundaries of the sea? Meaning these, the sea needs some containment, lest it burst out and wreak havoc. Right. So this is the salt sea. This is the cosmic. Is the cosmic sea? Is that the salt sea? Well, a little, little bit tricky there. <laughs> Um, right, right. Because in Genesis 1, we separate the waters above from the waters below. Yeah. There's really no uh, distinction yes. there in terms of what those particular waters are. Yeah, perhaps I'm asking for a level of coherence that isn't necessarily there. I don't know. Um, I mean, I picked up from somewhere that the deep, as it's used there in Genesis 1 verse 2, is connected, the word uh, is connected to a Mesopotamian word for Tiamat, their goddess of, of chaos. Um, does that say anything about the intention of the author at that point? Yeah, there's been a lot that's been written on that. There's been a lot that's been discussed about the relationship between those two. Mm. Some find a strong connection, some find less of a connection. But in terms of the words, yes, there's a relationship there. Um, in terms of the concept, there's a little bit debate there in terms of uh, exactly what the connection is between Tahom and Tiamat. Yes, there's a, a linguistic etymological connection, but conceptually they seem to be doing a little bit different things there. Okay, so we couldn't necessarily push that as far as to say this is a polemic against Mesopotamian culture. Right, right. Some have, um, and some have made some uh, pretty convincing arguments to that effect, and then others have pushed back and, and are not as convinced. <laughs> well, so okay. sit on the fence there a little bit right now. No, 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 it's fine. I, I'm talking to an academic, so I, sh- I should expect uh, a fair amount of that, of course, because that's what you argue about uh, all the time. This is your, your field. Um, right, one that I've been uh, looking forward to asking you about. Um, you say that the Earth was believed to be flat, in the ancient Near East. Now, this is going to please flat earth proponents because they often do say that the Bible is a flat earth book. So I guess in a sense, they're right. But does that therefore give biblical warrant for actually believing that the earth is flat, in your opinion? 
Well, I no, <laughs> as we walk through the history of interpretation a little bit in the book, we see some changes taking place between the New Testament times and the Old Testament in terms of what that looks like. Yeah. In the Old Testament, it's pretty clear they thought of the earth as being flat, a small, relatively small, flat disk. However, Aristotle came along, actually even before the Old Testament was completed, and so by the time the New Testament is around, Aristotelian cosmology is pretty well accepted throughout the world. And so uh, there's some pushback. Um, for example, I, you know, I talk about it in, in the second part of the book about how uh, Lactantius, he says, no, this is ridiculous that the earth is flat. And Augustine, he even thinks, well, that's it's ridiculous to consider that there's people on the other side of the earth with their feet facing towards our feet, you know, that they're upside down. But he does say at the end of that little argument, I could be wrong about this. <laughs> okay. Um, and a, an academic at heart, indeed. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so he's willing to acquiesce to the possibility that there are people living on the other side of the earth. Mm. Well, I, can I just interrupt? Because I, I, I want to get to that in, in a few minutes. I want to establish first with you that it really is the case that the Old Testament, let's say, is a flat earth set of writings there. Because, you know, some will point to scriptures like, uh, you do mention Job 22, uh, this is from the King James Version, uh, verse 14. Thick clouds are a covering to him that he seeth not, and he walketh in the circuit of the heaven, maybe suggesting um, some circularity there to the earth. I don't know. Job 26.10, he has inscribed a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. Uh, this is the ESV I'm quoting from now. Uh, right. Proverbs 8.27, when he established the heavens, I was there when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. And then uh, this one, I think, perhaps is the best one. Isaiah 40.22, right. it is he who sits above the circle of the earth and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. So there we are, the circle of the earth. Does that not teach a globe some have taken it that way um, but typically the ones who do that are the ones who again are are looking to find evidence of modern science and our modern understanding of the world in the old testament and i, I go through the, in the book and kind of dispel each one of those and talk about what they're really talking about and kind of at the core what we have here is a circle is not a sphere Right. Right. Yeah. In one respect, a circle is, you might say, like a hula hoop laid flat on the ground. And so the circle in that one, I believe that's the Isaiah 40 passage. And by the way, that's inscribed by a compass. Right? And a compass can only make a 2D circle, yeah. um, a two dimensional circle. And in the circle of the heavens, well, this makes sense in light of the firmament, the dome that we've spoken of before as well as a, as a, as a convex feature above the earth. So probably take a little bit more work than we have here to kind of uh, straighten out all of those issues. But uh, in the book, I do work through kind of the exegetical process of showing what is going on here in terms of why we're talking about a two-dimensional circle rather than a three-dimensional sphere. Absolutely. We, that's why people need to read the book. We can't possibly go through all the steps that you discuss in the book. But um, just to summarize that, then I suppose this is like a plan view, isn't it, from God's perspective, looking down and seeing a, a disc from the top of the dome. Correct. That certainly seems to make a lot of sense of what's said there. Okay, so we need to talk a little bit more about this idea of accommodation, which is very important. You have mentioned it. Um, this seems to be key to understanding what's going on from a theological perspective. So this is the idea that God has spoken, or in this case, he's caused scripture to be written in such a way that accommodates the specific language and thought forms of that particular culture to what he intended to convey. Um, I like to, I don't know whether you agree with this, but I like to think of the, uh, the culture being a kind of blank sheet that's shared by everybody. And onto that, then you write the message. So, so if that's the case, he was accommodating to the cosmology of the day in order to convey primarily theological truths. Um, is that essentially what you are saying? That the Bible is a conduit of theological truth and not a conduit of scientific truth? Uh, yeah, primarily. Now, this is where there's a lot, <laughs> this is where there's becomes a lot of debate. Um, uh, particularly among evangelicals, in terms of what does it mean for God to yeah. uh, God to speak Absolutely. truth? 
for some for scripture to be inspired all the dates have to be accurate all of the historical events have to be in the proper order and all the science has to be according to our modern understanding of science um, I, I don't think that that's necessary, just as the way that we had talked about literary styles, literary conventions, literary forms for one communicator to express an idea to another communicator. I think that holds true for scripture as well. Uh, scripture is written in a variety of genres. One of the genres that scripture is written in is historiography. In other words, God speaks about history But he's not talking about human history. He's talking about theological history, redemptive history. What is God up to is the main storyline. How that is communicated can vary depending on the the conventions of an author. I think that holds true with scientific ideas as well. The scientific ideas need to make sense in light of the people to whom it is originally spoken. And not to people who will live 4,000 years later when they have the luxury of modern theories to deal with. That is a very powerful point, actually. I do find that very convincing. However, it does leave us with a difficult task. It leaves us with some problems, some challenges, because how do we decide what is, to use a a metaphor here, you know, what what is the kernel and what is the husk when we come to this? What what controls can we have um, when we read the scripture here as to what is the real message and what's merely the vehicle of communication? I mean, there's a great danger here, isn't there, of missing something and throwing away something that is valuable because we think that's just a vehicle, whereas actually it's the message. You're right, and I think there is a danger there, but there's also a danger of uh, having so much hubris to, as to think that we've got it right and everybody else has got it wrong. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's the primary reason of the second section of the book is to walk through how later interpreters wrestled with the challenge of a change in, in scientific understanding. Yes, Everyone that I track throughout are people who hold a high view of scripture, a very high view of scripture. And I would dare say, in a lot of cases, higher than many of us today hold to Scripture's authority. But they were not necessarily afraid to reconsider their interpretations given new information. And it's not necessarily one person who makes the change. Right? This happens over the course of centuries and millennia. But over the course of time, people's views do change on how Scripture is to be understood. So – so you're right that there's the danger there in throwing it all out and say, you know, Scripture is completely subjective and, and I can pick and choose on what I, what I think is truth and what is, what is just to be taken in some sort of figurative way. But the other, the other danger is to hold so fast to my view of Scripture and to my interpretation of Scripture that I don't have ears to hear the wisdom of other, of other sages. Yes, um, I agree. Um, I'm just thinking that this necessitates, certainly when we're talking about, well, all of it really, um, it necessitates the role of the expert in informing us about culture at the time, which would help us then to choose between the kernel and the husk. But there again, there's a risk there, isn't there? Um, that you could make the expert something of a modern day Gnostic, you know, you, you hold the key to the understanding of, of, of the text. And, and without that, you know, we, we can't just understand the, what people often refer to as the, the plain meaning of the, sure. of the text. And in fact, does not um, Paul say, I think it's in Galatians, you know, that I think I'm getting here from the J.B. Phillips version, that the gospel is as clear as daylight. Um, doesn't seem as clear as daylight if we have to defer to an expert. And of course, expertise changes from one person to another, one institution to another, and one age to another. Yeah, that's a good point. And, uh, you know, that comes back to the, the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture. I'm throwing out a big word there that uh, I talk about a little bit in the book. No problem. We like big words on this podcast. So that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the idea that Scripture is clear. Well, we know that Scripture is not clear on everything. Um, if Scripture were clear on everything, then Ezra would not have had to stood up and explain the scriptures when he was reading them aloud at the water gate. In fact, the word that is used there in the Hebrew is a word that basically means exegete. So um, we might say that Ezra was giving an expository sermon there at the water gate because everything is not crystal clear. 
Um, the doctrine of the perspicuity of Scripture means that it is clear on matters of faith and practice. It is clear on matters necessary for salvation that we can agree upon. There's other things that need some teasing out, that need some wrestling with, yeah, yeah. and will frankly remain, will remain somewhat muddied for many of us uh, throughout our lifetimes. And and that leads to many books and commentaries and and such, right? If, if scripture were completely clear, we would yes. not have 5,000 commentaries yeah, on the Gospel yeah. of Matthew, for example. Well, that's a good point. But we can rest assured that the Gospel is clear insofar as our relationship with God and uh, through Christ. Precisely. Um, okay, well, let's talk Precisely. just a little bit about this part two. As I said before, it's, it's, it's very convoluted, very, very interesting. Um, so this is cosmology and scripture in historical context. You demonstrate how very thinkers down the ages, Christian, some Jewish thinkers as well, have attempted in their various ways to accommodate the changing cosmology of their times to the reading of the biblical text. So you look at how interpreters interacted with Aristotelian cosmology when that came along. Um, and then, of course, how interpreters of the scriptures had to do that all over again. We're well, not the same people, but well, perhaps in some cases, um, had to deal with the Copernican cosmology when that came along. So two major shifts going on there, each requiring some degree of accommodation. I think you make that right. very clear in your book that that did, in fact, happen. However very difficult to do and there were lots of rather embarrassing attempts <laughs> that did take place um could you give us some um, well i suppose it would be helpful if you could just give us a brief idea of how the cosmology of aristotle differed from the ancient cosmology and we'll go from there the primary difference was we moved from a flat earth to these concentric circles right the aristotelian cosmology had earth at the center of the cosmos with uh, and depends on who you ask, anywhere from seven to 40, some I don't remember, concentric circles that would rotate around the earth and that they were spheres within spheres and each one was moved by a previous one and all of them were moved by the unmoved mover. Right. And for the Catholic Church, this actually worked quite well because if the earth is the center of the cosmos, that puts – um, and Rome is the center of the earth. <laughs> that puts Rome at the center of the cosmos. And the unmoved mover could easily be interpreted as God controlling it all. So that, that worked out quite well. Yeah. I take your point about that, but there's a kind of weird ambivalence about that, because I read John Hadley Brook about this, and he made the comment that when the Copernican Revolution came around, that actually the earth was, in a sense, promoted, because under the Aristotelian system – the center was the worst place to be. It was the least divine place to be. So there's a weird kind of uh, it being the best place and the worst place to be. But uh, just a point that I noticed while I was reading the book. Well, that's we do step outside of kind of my area of comfort there when we start getting to, into the medieval interpretations. But uh, sure. in my understanding of the Aristotelian cosmology, that was one of the one of the things that really helped yeah. Aristotelian cosmology keep its uh, stranglehold on human thought, the way that the church had co-opted it. Yeah. I suppose you find in it what attracts you and use it, don't you? That's, that's a very natural thing to do. Sure. Yeah. So I noticed that this caused the exegetes a lot of trouble. Um, and one particular one was how to deal with the waters above and the waters below of Genesis 1. I could just just give sort of right. a brief idea of what schemes they had to try to come up with anyway. Right. Well, if you're reading Genesis 1 – very literally, and you see waters above and waters below, and you move from a flat earth to a sphere, and you've got a firmament that goes – surrounds this sphere, how are there waters that also surround the sphere? Because we know that water flows down. So naturally, this water would eventually just trickle off of the, the hamster ball, if you will, <laughs> and there would be no waters above. Yeah. So uh, one suggestion, if I remember correctly, I think it was uh, Basel that – that recommended this. It was like the Roman arches then, that you, what you see below is not what is actually happening above, so that there would be sort of a, a Roman arch there that's that you would see from below that would be the, the firmament, but above that was a level floor for the waters to rest on. So that was one clever way of dealing with that. Mm. So at the time, a description of gravity in terms of motion towards the center of the earth was not available. 
Right, but they still knew that things fell, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So they attempted then to fit the Bible with the state of what we might call science at the time, and it caused Correct. trouble, but they did attempt to do it. Right, and I think another one, it, and I may miss the, the reference, but I'm pretty sure it was Luther who basically just gave up on the matter <laughs> and said, <laughs> uh, this is beyond me, I can't figure it out. Uh, some things are just too great for humans to to imagine something very loosely related to that. Mm. So. <laughs> well, yeah, honest, I suppose. If you don't know the answer, you don't know the answer. You uh, bring up Luther and Calvin with respect to the Copernican revolution, because of the next step, and you say that right. certainly Luther, but even Calvin were really too early to have been impacted by that shift. Um, although you suggest there might have been some awareness in Calvin, but not really to have affected things very much for him. But others, of course, were affected. Um, have you got any examples of how people tried to accommodate the Copernican Revolution? Yeah, so the Copernican Revolution, that was the, the one where the center of the universe was moved from the Earth to the Sun. So we're not, still not talking about a universe. We're still talking about a solar system. Hmm. And that raised some issues for biblical interpretation because it moved humans from no longer being the focal point of God's creation to the sun being the focal point of God's creation. So Luther and Calvin, they seem to have wrestled a little bit with the Copernican Revolution, but ultimately were too close to it to have really had a chance to think it through and, and see how, how that's going to affect their interpretation of Scripture. Um, the biggest issue, of course, is the Galilean Inquisition and what that meant for him and that whole episode. Hmm. So we do see this struggle going on, trying to understand what the scripture means as the prevailing cosmology changes. Right. Very interesting. But I think there will be some people who might think, well, is this really worth doing? I mean, couldn't you just say, well, the scriptures say such and such? Well, there's this phrase, isn't there? The Bible says what it means and means what it says. And you just right. take, that's what it says. And therefore, any cosmology that moves away from what the Bible seems to say is therefore for a false cosmology, and then you never have a problem. Now, I'm not recommending that, but I think some people might think that. Um, what would be so wrong in taking that attitude? Yeah, well, that's that's what led to the Galilean Inquisition, mm -hmm. right, is that the church wanted to yeah. do that. If Joshua 10 says the sun stood still, well, the sun stood still. It wasn't the earth. If, it, if scripture meant for the earth to stand still, it would have said so. Mm -hmm. But recognizing that Scripture is speaking the language that the hearers understand from their phenomenological point of view, the way that they see things, it makes sense for them to say that the sun stood still because from their perspective, that is what's happening. So the Copernican Revolution then in the, in the Galilean Inquisition really kind of opens our eyes and sheds some light on what it means to hold too firmly, too fastly to an interpretation of scripture that doesn't have any bearing on the redemptive narrative to begin with. Hmm. Would you say that as these, what you might call scientific challenges to various aspects of the Bible come along, and they do come along, would you say then that they're not actually falsifying the Bible? What they're doing is challenging our interpretation of the Bible and when that happens, it behooves us then to think, I'm looking at this particular portion of scripture incorrectly. I therefore need to do some more study on this area, perhaps look at the kind of thing that you've been talking about, looking at ancient Near East culture or whatever sure. it is, and then find where that little bit of misunderstanding actually comes from. And in those cases, we will find that we will be able to marry the reality of the natural world that's presented to us by the findings of proper science and the scripture that's presented to us. Do you think that is a sort of method of going about this problem? Yeah, that's perfectly said. I couldn't have said it better myself. It's when we become too entrenched on our own interpretations. Well, first of all, we have to recognize that our own interpretations are very limited in and of themselves. There's so much that we yeah. don't know. Sure. Even our understanding, for those of us who can read the original languages, there's still much to be learned about the original languages. Hmm. And that's very few of us. Most of us are reading the Bible in translation, and we're relying on experts even there to bring the text to us. We also need to be aware that there are other experts, sometimes archaeologists, sometimes linguists, 
sometimes anthropologists, even just in the in our own understanding of scripture, for it to make sense to us. Um, I, I think about what goes into making a translation of scripture from the original language into whatever language it is, how much work it goes into that that is taken for granted by the average interpreter. Now, that doesn't mean that you need to know the original languages to be able to be a faithful reader of scripture and to be able to interpret scripture well. Yeah. But just understand that all of us have some sort of handicap when we approach Scripture. Indeed. But we do have those resources there, perhaps more than we've ever had. So sure. they are available. We must use them. And I do actually find this all very fascinating. And very, I find it very helpful for my faith, actually, when I come to something in the Bible that really does cause me problems. And then I find there is an answer when I turn to some academic materials that have been made available to me. All the hard work has been done by people such as yourselves. Right. You know, I don't read Hebrew and Greek. You know, I'd be, I'd be floundering if I was trying to do that all the time. So it's uh, wonderful, I think, the, the kind of thing that you you chaps, I won't say guys because I'm an Englishman, you chaps do. Um, so the, <laughs> Appreciate it. Uh, I feel honored. Um, so the uh, the conclusion then, this is where we're going to get a bit of controversy going here. So this is uh, part three, and you call Scripture and Science. Okay, so you note some of the different ways in which various Bible-believing Christians have reacted to the challenges of modern science, uh, some more accommodating, as we've been discussing, and some far less accommodating. So your main conclusion, now, do correct me if I'm wrong, seems to be that we should learn from the past and its attempts, some good attempts, some failed attempts, to uphold scripture when it seems to conflict with new scientific theories, and be ready to reinterpret scripture to be consistent with science. Let me just say that a little bit again. We should be ready to reinterpret scripture to be consistent with science. Now, have I got you right on that? Yes, for the most part, to the extent that scripture had to be reinterpreted to make sense of the Aristotelian revolution and the Copernican revolution. Now, what I'm not saying, and this is maybe a point of clarification, what I'm not saying is that science trumps scripture. What I am saying, however, is that the two coexist, yeah. right? The, uh, the God who authored scripture is the God who authored science. Um, so the two will not be in conflict in that sense. Okay. Uh, God will not be speaking out of his mouth on one side of his mouth and saying one thing and on the other side of his mouth revealing another thing. Psalm 19 might be a good example of that, how God reveals himself both through word and through natural revelation. And so it's important that we, again, not try to shoehorn scripture into science, but understand that the two can coexist together. If there's a conflict, where is the conflict? Is it because we're misunderstanding the science? Is it because we're misunderstanding scripture? Are we misunderstanding both? <laughs> are we inadequate in, in the two areas? Those are the kinds of things I'm talking about. Okay, well, I'm going to sort of dis disagree with you and agree with you, if I may. Um, I'm going to take a sentence that you write. This is on page 220 of your book. You quote from Augustine, uh, where he warns Christians not to talk a lot of nonsense about things they don't know about, uh, lest people think that Christians have got nothing to say about spiritual matters either. It's a great passage. If, if anybody gets the book, then uh, do look at that passage on page 220. And then you say, and this is a quote from you, um, which is much like what you said, but I just want to comment upon it. Uh, these sage words from Augustine remind us that when we pit scripture against science or written revelation against natural revelation, we are defending the faith not from secularism, but from sincerity. Now, I think that's an interesting sentence because I wonder whether you might agree that you've actually conflated science with natural revelation. Because it's one thing to say God reveals truths about himself through nature. It's another thing to say that science as a human action, as a human activity, necessarily picks up on that correctly. Sure. This, this is the problem that I have with maybe what you're suggesting, because science can be wrong. You know, I've just talked recently to Dr. Robert Marx just a couple of weeks ago, who contests neo-Darwinism. He says it's not a hard science because it's every attempt to mathematically model it fails. So possibly it's not right. So, I mean, there we have something that is establishment science and it might actually be wrong in some major aspects. So you see what I mean? There, There is a problem here, isn't there? If we just accept the latest science and say, ah, oh, that's natural revelation, whereas actually it might be human erring. Sure. It might be a you know sociological phenomenon in various ways, pressures causing institutions to produce material that's not actually revealing God 
at all. No, I, I would agree with that. Um, and we have to be careful that we don't just go with the latest scientific fad. For um, yeah. However, mm-hmm. I, I would say that it that it's behooves us to not ignore what the consensus is saying, uh, whatever the whatever the scientific topic. And I'm not going to list a bunch here, but just whatever whatever the issue might be. If that has a long track record of refinement, now there, there's a difference between being overthrown and being refined, right? The Aristotelian cosmology was overthrown. The Copernican cosmology was not entirely right, okay, yeah. but it's was mostly right, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. The Earth does revo- in fact revolve around the sun. There's just been some fine tuning to the Copernican cosmology. So I guess it would help us to make some judgments there in terms of um, is this an article that was written by a scientist and um, mm-hmm. and it seems striking and therefore I need to reinvent my whole theological construct as a result of this? Or is this the work of cross-disciplinary scientists who keep drawing the same conclusions, maybe tweaking it, maybe fine-tuning it? But it seems to be pointing in that direction. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Um, however, I don't want to go on pushing this too far, but um, it is an interesting question. Uh, I think your example about the Aristotelian science, in a sense, makes the other point as well. In that, you sure. know, that was what we over two thousand years with that uh, prevailing as the science of the day. And so, in point of fact, people were wrong to try to conform their biblical interpretation to that science. Well, that should tell us something. We think we've got it all right today, but we might be wrong in some very right. serious aspects. And of course, I'm not saying that we've necessarily got our view of the cosmos wrong, but there are some, some other aspects which I personally, when evolution would be one, um, I'm not a creationist. Um, okay. Well, I'm, in one sense, I suppose I believe that God created, but I'm not a six-day creationist. But I have some issues about evolution, but the establishment says such and such, and you're an idiot if you don't believe it, etc. But I take warning there that we shouldn't give in too easily, you know? Well, if I could, if I could c- come back to the yeah. sure, um, sure. Aristotelian cosmology, you're right. But also, even though the Aristotelian cosmology was overturned, it was also more correct than the ancient Near Eastern cosmology. So, <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting point. Yes, um, okay. So you're right. There's it, it, So we do have to be somewhat I, – I guess I should say we, regardless of the position we hold – we need to hold those somewhat loosely, recognizing that we could be wrong on either count. Mm. So I, I, you know, this is this is a long-term project here, and that we're talking about centuries and not months and and days in terms of how we and how we determine scripture. But I think in terms of being faithful interpreters, we act on scripture and on the knowledge that we have. Okay, so yeah, this is this is uh, as you say, long-term and a difficult thing, and it shouldn't worry us. So the picture I'm getting here is of different levels of certainty with respect to scientific challenges. Um, We may have more reason to be suspicious of a particular scientific claim than others. Um, When we find one that we are more suspicious of, perhaps that will then take us to the scripture to say, well, is there some real conflict here? And then find that maybe we have reason to say, no, I I reject that science because there are holes in it. Um, But where there's at least seems to us a more secure science that comes along that then challenges our view of scripture, um, we would then go to the valid array of interpretations out there that we wouldn't just say, oh, well, that shows Scripture to be wrong, but we would say, what are the choices here? What is that leading me towards finding in, in, the, in the world of academia that would al- allow me to see that Scripture slightly differently? Um, so there seems to be a kind of helpful dialectic going on here, where there is sort of room, room for maneuver on both ways. I think, as you said before, it's not that science trumps Scripture, or that our interpretation of Scripture trumps science, but there is this meaningful dialectic going on in our minds based upon our judgments as to relative certainty in each case difficult thing to do does that kind of make sense yeah i think it does and i i would go along with that quite finely 
What a relief. <laughs> <laughs> this is difficult, this sort of thing, because it really is quite abstract, isn't it? In some ways, the, the subject matter seems so concrete and earthly, dealing with things like water and air and, <laughs> and, and firmaments and things. But when you actually come to these uh, methods of interpretation and things, then it becomes rather more difficult. And uh, it's been a, a fascinating and controversial discussion, Dr. Greenwood. I've, I've loved every minute of it. Um, great stuff. I would just say that uh, Scripture and Cosmology is available from ivpress.com. And of course, I will give notes to that uh, in the show notes for today. Very enjoyable book, packed with interesting information. As I said, it challenges us to think more carefully about how we do interpret the Bible, given the advances that have taken place in ancient Near East studies. Um, It's not without scope for disagreement, but books that provoke that kind of reaction are a good thing, and I think we need to be challenged as well as informed. Great read, great book. Um, So just before we close, Dr. Greenwood, could you tell us if there are any other resources, books, website that you would like to lead people towards? Well, it's an interesting topic. It's vast. Mm. You know, one that came to mind is a book that I just finished reading recently. It's a book by Brent Strawn called The Old Testament is Dying. And he kind of lays out some of the same ideas in terms of uh, not so much the context, but in terms of interpretation of scripture and uh, necessity for reading scripture carefully. Uh, you mentioned John Walton. A number of his resources are always very helpful as well. Uh, a couple of websites, Biologos website, and also the American Scientific Affiliation is an organization that I'm a member of, and they work on this idea of faith and science, and what is the area in which we can bridge and reconcile the gaps between uh, sometimes these contentious issues. Wonderful. That's what we need. Dialogue, not warfare. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Greenwood, for coming on the show. It's been a delight to speak to you. Well, thanks for inviting me, Julian. Appreciate it.